Oh, thank you. Um, as opposed to David Rakoff, who's on his way into the United States, uh, I'm on my way out. Uh, I left New York 10 years ago and moved to France, and then I moved to England, and I was just granted indefinite leave to remain. So that means I can stay for the rest of my life, and then I can apply for my British passport, uh, which is something that's exciting to me, the opportunity to do that. And I, I can keep my American passport. Um, but still, it's something I'm not, uh, again, I, I can stay so I don't have to do it, it's just, but thinking about doing it makes me think all the more about um, America, which is where I grew up, and, you know, when you live there, things are just normal to you, and then you, you don't really notice them until you leave. I go back to the United States twice a year, I go on these lecture tours, so in October I'll go to 31 cities and I'll do the same in April. And like when I lived in the United States, I didn't ever realize how you can talk about money all the time, everywhere you go. So I'll go back to the United States and I'll be on a, living in France where you cannot talk about money at all. Then I go back to the United States and I'll be on a plane and someone will say, one guy will say to another, I like your watch. And guy number two will say, well, you should. It cost me $4,000. <laughs> And I grew up with that, and I love that, absolutely <laughs> love it. Because I'm the one who will go into someone's house and I will, say, I will ask how much things cost. And in France, people are just appalled. Like, you're not even supposed to acknowledge somebody's sideboard, let alone ask how much it costs. Um, and I was in a cab here yesterday, and I don't know where the cab driver was from, but he, but he said, oh, I detect an accent. Uh, where are you from? And I said, I'm from the United States. And he thought for a moment and he said, how did you keep from being shot? <laughs> and I thought, he doesn't know how obnoxious I am. So it wasn't, it wasn't that kind of question. It wasn't like, how did I personally keep from getting shot? It, it's just that from watching the news, he gathered that America is an incredibly dangerous place. And I just went to Rio for the first time. And everything that I read led me to believe that if I can make it alive to my hotel, I should double bolt the door and never leave. And actually, uh, Rio wasn't bad. I mean, nothing, certainly nothing happened to me. But, but I could understand how from watching the news you would get that idea about America. Um, how, so how did I keep from, how is it that I never got shot? Well, and then when you live there, you, there are places you can go to get shot. You know, like, <laughs> and I know where those places are, and I, I try my best to avoid them. Um, I wrote a story a few years ago. Uh, one thing that's always funny about America is that it can't yet, there, there, there are no limits to the ridiculousness of guns, right? So I, I wrote, I had included this in a story that in Texas, the blind can legally hunt, but they need to be with a sighted person, right? But in Michigan, they don't. In Michigan, a blind person can go out into the woods on his own with a gun and shoot it, whatever makes noise. But how does he find whatever he shot, right? Like even if he were to say, that sounds like a deer, and he shot it, and then he heard it, the antlers like hit a tree, so he knew that it was a deer, how would he find it and how would he get it home? Um, and then I was reading in the paper a while ago that in national parks, you're not allowed to bring guns into national parks like Yosemite. Well, the National Rifle Association wants that to change, right? And their argument is, what about our women? You know, would you, well, how, how funny would you find it if your 16-year-old daughter were raped in Yosemite? How funny would you find it then? So, but they're afraid that that if people can go into the national parks with, with guns, 
then they're just gonna they're just gonna shoot bears in the face. Is basically what they they won't be afraid as afraid as they should be of the wildlife, um, and so they're going to wind up killing a lot of animals. Um, it's funny to me. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, and then I was going to just read this little thing because David read, and I thought, and someone just handed me this book, and so I thought, why not? And this is this is American to me, and it's the beginning of a story called Town and Country. They looked like people who would just attended a horse show. A stately couple in their late 60s, he in a cashmere blazer, and she in a gray tweed jacket, a jam-encrusted shamrock glittering against the rich felt of her lapel. They were my seatmates on the flight from Denver to New York, and as I stood in the aisle to let them in, I felt the shame of the tragically outclassed. The sport coat I had prided myself on now looked clownish, as did my shoes and the fistful of pine straw I referred to as my hair. <laughs> Excuse me, I said, apologizing basically for my very existence. <laughs> the couple took their seats, and just as I settled in beside them, the man turned to the woman, saying, I don't want to hear this shit. <laughs> I assumed he was continuing an earlier argument, but it turned out he was referring to the Gershwin number the airline had adopted as its theme song. <laughs> I can't believe the fucking crap they make you listen to on planes nowadays. The woman patted her silver hair and agreed, saying that whoever had programmed the music was an asshole. <laughs> A cocksucker, the man corrected her. Goddamn cocksucking asshole. They weren't loud people and didn't even sound all that angry, really. This was just the way they spoke the verbal equivalent of the everyday China. <laughs> Amongst company, the wife might remark that she felt a slight chill, but here that translated to, I am fucking freezing. <laughs> Me too, her husband said. It's cold as shit in here. <laughs> shit is the tofu of cursing and can be molded to whichever conditions a speaker desires. Hot as shit. Windy as shit. I myself was confounded as shit. <laughs> For how had I so misjudged these people? Why, after all these years, do I still believe that expensive clothing signifies anything more than a disposable income? That tweed and cashmere actually bespeak refinement? When our boxed bistro meals were handed out, the couple really went off. <laughs> what is this garbage? The man asked. It's shit, his wife said. A box of absolute fucking shit. The man took out his reading glasses and briefly examined his plastic wrapped cookie before tossing it back into the box. First they make you listen to shit, and then they make you eat it. Well, I'm not fucking eating it, the woman said. We'll just have to grab something at the airport and pay some son of a bitch 15 bucks for a sandwich. The wife sighed and threw up her hands. What choice do we have? It's either that or read what we've got, which is shit. <laughs> oh, it's all shit. <laughs> it was as if they'd kidnapped the grandparents from a Ralph Lauren ad <laughs> and forced them into a David Mamet play. <laughs> and that, in part, is why the couple so appealed to me. There was something ridiculous and unexpected about them. They made a good team, and I wish that I could spend a week or two invisibly following behind them and seeing the world through their eyes. 